All right. So we're going to talk a little bit today about the biomechanics of the aorta. Um, feel a little intimidated, uh, Jennifer, talking about this with you running this session. So jump on in if I say anything wrong, by all means. Um, just to start, I have uh, no disclosures that are relevant to this presentation. Uh, my objectives for this morning's session are going to be to summarize uh, the mechanical properties of the thoracic aorta, starting with healthy people, and then describing some of the changes that occur pathophysiologically that we see in thoracic aortic aneurysms. I'm going to go over some of the ways that we actually study these mechanics, and I'll keep the focus a little bit on echo, given uh, the symposium's uh, orientation. And then finally, I'm going to bring up a few of the clinical applications of aortic biomechanics. So let's start with aortic tissue properties, which do define how the aorta behaves once we stress it um, during the uh, cardiac cycle. Now, the macrostructure is familiar to pretty much uh, everybody that's joining this symposium. So, you know, we have the three layers of the intima, the media, and the adventitia. So I'm going to go a bit more into the microstructure, which is what really gives the mechanical properties of the tissue. So the microstructure can be divided into the cellular and the non-cellular components. So some of the common components, I'm going to just basically focus on the main uh, ones that you see in most of the literature. There's uh, plenty of things that I'm going to have to admit because of time. So the cellular component that we'll concentrate on this morning, there's the smooth muscle cells. And those have both secretion function as well as mechanical function. Then on the inner layer, you have the endothelial cells, which aren't shown on this image. And those contribute in part with communication into the media. Uh, particularly, they have cross links with some of the smooth muscle cells. And then the endothelial cells also provide the, some of the viscoelastic properties of the aorta, which will become um, important later on. The adventitial layer is fairly rich with fibroblasts. Those are also not shown in, the, in this picture. And then finally, the myofibroblasts are recruited during times of tissue inju injury and are responsible for some of the uh, repair mechanisms. So those have become a point of focus in a lot of the pathophysiology. Now, the extracellular matrix is, the, uh, is a large contributor to the overall mechanical properties that we see. It's made up of the elastin. So the elastin will be coiled in these elastic lamellae. And then what they will do is they will stretch under low, low loading situations. So they'll have a very nice smooth elastic motion in the early part and mid parts of the cardiac cycle when the stresses are low. You then have collagen. And what collagen will do is it will stay wavy or crimped during the early part of the cardiac cycle. And then only towards the end, towards the higher points of loading, will they become uncrimped and they don't have the same elastic nature as the elastin. And they're more responsible for the overall structural integrity of the aortic wall. And then you also have proteoglycans and the proteoglycans will make links with hyaluronin as well as with the other components of the extracellular matrix and with the smooth muscle cells. And so the uh, proteoglycan hyaluronin complex creates basically almost like a compressible aggregate that smooths out some of the transmission of stresses through the wall and then by their connections to smooth muscle cells also can help with the mechanical uh, transduction. So now, what do we see in a thoracic aortic aneurysm? So we'll see a constellation of changes on histopathology. So one of the things will be, we start to see death of smooth muscle cells. Another thing that we'll see is fragmentation of your proteoglycans. And then these fragments will actually begin to pool around areas of elastin injury. The elastin fires, fibers themselves will start to become degraded, torn, damaged. And then finally, we'll begin to see changes in the collagen. So often what happens is that the damaged elastin is then replaced with collagen. And this collagen isn't always the same type of collagen that was there uh, to begin with. So now when we know these changes and we're trying to study what these changes mean from a biomechanical standpoint, how do we test this or how are we studying this? So a great deal of research up to this point had been done using benchtop mechanical testing. So either axial where you're stretching it in one direction or biaxial as is shown here where you're stretching it in two directions at the same time. And 
Uh, basically, this is you cut tissue out, you map it, put it into quadrants, and then you put it onto the stretch tester. And what that will do is have hooks into the tissue, and then you will apply a deformation to the tissue, and that will give you the associated stress. And so that's what a lot of the publications have been focused on up till, till, re till more recently. So when you biaxial uh, stress test, biaxial test a piece of aortic tissue in a normal healthy individual, on the left panel, what you kind of what you end up seeing is that you see the combination of the effects of the elastin and the collagen on the shape of the curve. And so it's not a straight curve, it's a nonlinear elastic um, response. So what you'll have is early in the deformation, you'll have a very much elastin dominated part of the curve. And then as you get towards higher um, deformation, the collagen, which is the red dashed line, will start to become engaged. And then the shape of the curve will then represent over time less and less and less elastin function and more and more and more collagen function. So the nonlinear shape is one thing that we typically see. The other thing that is common on the right-hand panel is this idea that a hysteresis is, is made. So what that means is that when we stretch or load the tissue and then unload the tissue, the line doesn't follow itself. It, there's a space in between the two. And that space between them is what we call energy loss. And that will bring, I'll bring that up later on. And that energy loss is representative of the viscoelastic properties of the aorta. So when we do some mechanical testing, there's plenty of uh, different metrics that have been measured and described. I've just represented a cluster of some of them. So what you can do is you can look at the straight parts of the curve, so the low end of the deformation and the high end, and that will give you tangential moduli or the slopes of the curve at these points. As I would mentioned, there's a period where elastin function starts to give way to more collagen function in terms of the shape of the curve. And so this creates a transition zone. So we can try to measure where that transition zone begins. And then, as I had earlier alluded to, we can look at that space in between the loading and unloading curve to measure energy loss. Then what you can do is you can take some points at the beginning of the curve and the end of the curve and generate some form of a slope between those two, and that will give you some measure of an overall elastance. And then finally, one of the tests that it'll do is fail as a, some form of a failure test where you'll basically stretch it uni, unidirectionally, or not unidirectionally, you'll just stretch, load it, you won't unload it, but you'll stretch it until the tissue fails and it breaks. And so then that's a tissue failure test. Now in the thoracic aortic aneurysm, when we do the same benchtop testing, we've come up generally with different looking curves. And so what you'll find here are some changes in those five measures that I had just mentioned. So right here on the left, I've, looked, I've shown an aneurysm in the red and the normal would be in the green. So you can generally see by having less elastin because of the elastin degradation and more collagen, the, sh for, the shape of the curve starts to be more collagen dominated earlier in the uh, deformation. And then you start to get into the high slope, stiff type of uh, met, uh, measures uh, earlier on as well. So what we would see from the uh, parameters I had brought up is you'd have your low tangential modulus would usually flatten down and your high tangential modulus will raise up. You might start to see an earlier transition zone as the collagen is activated earlier. You'll see an increase in energy loss. The overall slope of your curve should become steeper so you'll have less elastins. And even though collagen is a stiffer material, it's not it's in general weaker. So what you usually see with this tissue is that it, it uh, fails earlier on in the deformation curve. Now the bench top is very limited, obviously. You can only usually get abnormal tissue. You also can only get patients in a single slice of time. So either when they're coming for the prophylactic repair or you're um, testing tissue that's already been um, resected because it's dissected or ruptured. So advanced imaging has really led the way to some more imaging-based biomechanics. So two really important ways is with CT and MRI. And so I've shown here on the left is CT. What they can do is you can create stress maps of the aorta and look for points of high stress that might be more inclined for rupture or dissection. And then on the right-hand side, using 4D flow, you can look at uh, wall shear stress. But I would like to focus a bit more on ultrasound.
So one of the, you know, dating back for 30 years, people have done this where you can use M mode on an aortic structure and find a systolic and end diastolic diameter, and then use that to measure forms of stiffness of a stiffness index. So people have been looking at this actually for some time. I think one of the things that's really um, helped is the advent of speckle tracking and the use of it on the aorta. The speckle tracking, as many of us have seen it for um, LV or RV, what you can do is you can actually use the same technology to track the wall motion of the aorta and generate the same measures of um, stretch or strain. So this is an example of um, sort of the approach that we've been taking. So this is a cross section of the uh, ascending aorta. And so what we have done is we'll trace the walls and create our regions of interest. And then the walls will track and provide our measures of strain. Then what you can do is you can take your circumferential strain as you see here and divide it by sections. And from that, we'll pair it with our the pulse pressure or the uh, pulse wave at the, and, um, at the radial artery and then use a transfer function to de generate an aortic pulse wave. And then we can pair the strain and the pulse wave to generate pressure strain loops. And as you'll see, this looks very similar to what we had sort of uh, seen with the mechanical testing where you have the systolic component here in the solid line. And then during diastole, as it relaxes, you have the hysteresis with energy loss in the middle. And we can, also sort of, we can also start to appreciate where the low tangential modulus would be, as well as where that transition uh, zone occurs. So what are some of the clinical implications of this aortic biomechanics? So one of the probably most prominent areas would be in the use of determining risk for acute aortic events, so rupture or dissection. I think this is where a lot of the focus has been. This is a really uh, cool, one of the earlier papers I've, I think I've seen using echo uh, in this way, and this is done uh, with the Montreal group. And so using TEE, they did a similar strategy to what I had shown where you get strain of the circumferential strain. And what they did was paired it again with pressure to create a loop. And their loop on the bottom left panel, you can see is not that dissimilar from mine. It has a nice hysteresis. And then what they used was the slope of a measure of, el of an elastance, basically. And then when that was paired with the histopathology of the tissue that they collected, they found a correlation of decreasing elastance or an increasing slope with a higher proportion of collagen, i.e. a higher amount of pathophysiology, or I should say pathology. Another example, um, is where this was an, a really cool one because they actually were able to do the 4D flow on patients that had dissections before the dissected tissue was resected. And so they did uh, 4D flow MRI and they were able to do measures of the wall st uh, shear stress. And there is a, a few parameters that they matched this with. And I just wanted to bring out two that I, that I wanted to focus on. The one on the top is energy loss. And so as you can see the shear, as the wall shear stress increases, it correlated strongly with an increase in the energy loss. So again, as we sort of said, those are that energy loss is something we see increasing as the tissue becomes more and more abnormal. The bottom, uh, the bottom box is a delamination measure. And so that obviously delamination would be a very strong uh, indicator of propensity for dissection. And even though this was not uh, significant from a p-value standpoint, you can see the clear relationship as while your stress increases, it reflects um, more propensity for delamination or dissection. So I think this really shows that linking between some of the imaging that we can do and the ability to predict risk. Another uh, area that's kind of interesting is we actually start to see changes in the aorta after we do surgical interventions. So the graft material itself can have impacts on aortic function. So this was a study where they did the similar echo-based approach to measuring strain um, that, that I had shown previously. What they did was they did it before and after uh, ascending aortic resection. And so what they and they're doing this at the level of the proximal descending thoracic aorta. So as you can see, post-procedure on the right compared to pre-procedure on the left, you have an increased uh, descending thoracic aortic strain. So what's happening is because of the nature of the graft, it's actually changing how the pulse wave is transmitted 
and creating greater strain distal to where the graft had been done. So the graft is not itself is not a benign substance. We locally, we did a uh, study looking at the effects of EVAR, so further down in the abdomen, to see if how that might affect um, the aorta, the aortic impedance, and LV performance parameters proximally. And so what we found is, if you, is that it really um, had an impact on the reflected waves. So as your pulse wave transmits down, so on a normal patient, so the pre-EVAR on the left, your pulse wave tra transmits down the aorta and then it hits the branch points. And when it hits branch, hits branch points, this creates a drop or an increase in resistance depending on which branch point you're at. And these will create reflected waves, either positive or negative depression reflected waves. And so normally what will happen is that the deflected, the positive deflected wave will arrive in diastole and that sort of helps augment some of the coronary blood flow. And at the very least, it's not be required to be pushed against by the LV as it's ejecting. So what we found in our EVAR patients is that because that stiff material is now there, it alters the velocity of blood through the body and changes the timing and the size of the positive reflected wave. So what was happening now after the EVAR is that it will come back as a larger positive reflective wave and occur during systole. And this therefore increases the aortic impedance on the LV. And so we found acute uh, changes in diastolic function related to that. And then finally, this is a study on young patients that had thoracic, uh, that had T-bars for uh, thoracic aortic trauma. And then they followed them five years later on. And what they found was that this group had uh, significant changes in uh, their LVH, as well as 50% um, of the patients had new onset hypertension. And then also what was interesting is they began to see remodeling where there was dilation and lengthening of the ascending aorta proximal to the stent. And then finally, uh, as I mentioned, the stent does alter pulse wave transmission. So I like, this was kind of a cool case that we had found. So these are simultaneous pressure tracings on a patient from the right and left radial who'd had an endovascular total arch performed. So if you need sort of any proof that the graph material impacts how the pulse wave is transmitted, I mean, this is a very nice, clear, clear example. So in summary, it's the microstructure of the aorta that determines the mechanical properties that we care about. When you have aortic aneurysm formation, the pathophysiologic changes in that microstructure will result in differences in the biomechanics of that tissue. And we can use those biomechanical measures to then try to ascertain how severe the pathophysiology is. Now, amazing advancements in imaging technology have opened new doors for us to be able to have better clinical applications of biomechanics. So this should allow for uh, longitudinal studying. It can allow for large cohorts. We can do more studies on normal people. So I think that the uh, future is really exciting in this area. And then finally, uh, the abnormal aortic properties, it's more than just interesting for the people uh, resecting it. It's more than just interesting in, for risk stratification. It does actually have implications on patients uh, before and after their surgery that are applicable to all clinicians. And again, I would like to thank you all for having me this morning and always take emails at, at any time. Hello. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much, Alex, for your uh, wonderful presentation. We do have a few um, minutes. Uh, before the next speaker. Uh, so I would invite everyone to uh, put their uh, questions in the chat. And also after um, around 10, uh, 1030 or so, we'll also have a, a, um, a period of time to answer questions. So please get your, your questions in the chat. Uh, so um, thanks once again, Alex, for your, your talk. It was wonderful. A great summary of, of all the work that you, uh, you and the whole uh, Calgary group has done now for many, many years now. You guys have been studying this. It's, it's fantastic. Um, I was actually involved in that TTE study uh, in Montreal when I was there, where we tried to uh, have a, um, a imaging-based way of, of uh, assessing uh, aortic biomechanics. That's, that's our, our holy grail in our field, as you know. I was uh, wondering if you guys have had any success in translating it to transthoracic echo, and if you can elaborate on, on that. And also, 
what may be the limitations and uh, the challenges are with uh, with uh, echo based techniques for this. Yeah, those are those are the you basically asked all the answers, the questions we all need answers to. Um, you know, it's uh, it's actually really great. I mean, a lot of the Canadian centers have done an amazing job, right? Because you have you, the Toronto, Montreal, over in Calgary, everybody's really done a really good job of working on this. And everyone has a little bit of a slight different area that they might uh, be focusing on. Um, so I think for for ultrasound, so the the one question about the trans thoracic, so where we're at now is we are still focusing on the TEE. And I think it's only because of the, the quality of imaging, but the trans thoracic crossover is gonna be a man, absolute mandatory, I think, down the line. Um, I think once we have a handle on uh, figuring out how to calculate the biomechanics from TEE, my thought process is, is that we really then need to try to have simultaneous measurements in other modalities, whether that's CT and MRI and transthoracic, and figure out how these all translate with each other. Uh, there's some speckle tracking data on just LV function, where you can find out that using TTE versus TEE will give you different strain measures just in the LV. So like, I can't imagine that the aorta will be any different. So I think what we'll have to do is sort out um, if at least if there is a difference, hopefully it's a predictable one where you can just have some sort of a fudge factor that then makes the two equal. If not, then we'll basically need to create um, sets of normals for transthoracic and transesophageal. Because I do think transthoracic is going to be vital. Uh, and I, I think that because that leads me to the second part of your question in terms of the limitations and, and benefits of these different methods. So ultrasound is nice because it's portable, it's cheap, it's pretty non-invasive, and it's easy to do. Um, the image quality obviously is far less than what you get from CT or MRI. So I, I think what will have to happen is that we'll have to figure out the roles that each of these play. I don't think there's going to be one that that does everything. Um, and so I think it'll be really important for us to look at all modalities, figure out normal reference ranges, and then from there start to do these lo longitudinal studies. I will say the one real nice thing about echo, especially speckle tracking, is that it's really amenable to retrospective studies. Because the, even if you do the old, sort of the older traditional approach of the beta stiffness, beta stiffness index, you needed someone to do an M mode on the aorta at that time. So if you, that hadn't been done, which isn't a standard image to acquire intraoperatively or preoperatively with a transthoracic, you can't really do anything uh, with the beta stiffness. But meant most speckle tracking, as you know, is all done offline. So you could take thousands of images and have someone speckle track and whether you wanted to do just something simple like beta stiffness or some of these more complex measures then I think that would be very doable. And you don't have as much pre-operative CT imaging, although I know that's changing, everyone's making banks now, but I think that will be something that would be very helpful going forward. Mm -hmm. um, for sure, you, you, there's two different directions you can go, right? You can go more and more complex with uh, MRI and you can really, uh, so I, I sort of uh, really focus on MRI, but, um, and add more and more layers to that. Or you can say, well, what's most uh, available to everyone that they can do uh, with longitudinal studies in every single center, right? And so that, that would be the, the echo approach. Um, totally. so, um, and it could actually end up being very, very simple. We, we might be overcomplicating the problem. Uh, so you, you were in Penn, right? Uh, I think, uh, well, I think it was Pittsburgh actually that presented at the AATS uh, just this year where they were able to correlate stiffness in their aortic clinic with actual uh, aortic events, you know, aortic dissection. So the, yeah. the actual clinical out, um, endpoint that's uh, typically missing in, in our studies. Okay, so we do have a, um, we can fit in one more question. Let me ask one quick question. And yeah. we've tried to get these strain images in the OR a few times, but one of our problems is that the TE probe is sometimes too close to the aorta for us to get a, a full view of the descending. Do you guys use any spacers or any other trick tips or tricks on how to get these images to make sure we get as much of the aorta as possible? No, and unfortunately, we have we'll have that same we'll have that same problem. So, what, one of the things that we're going to actually try out is we want to see how epi, the epiortic probe works. So that maybe you can we're trying to see it, like we want to compare because the resolution is clearly different. So, what one of our next studies is going to be is trying to figure out how different it is. So, if they're comparable enough, then in areas where you have drop dropout, so sometimes it's post that posterior wall that drops out. Sometimes, depending where the PA comes across, you'll get shadowing. So if there's dropout, can you just use an epi aortic to substitute? So that's one thing we kind of wanted to look at. 
And then the other thing is kind of to Jennifer's point, like, I think that simultaneously we're going deeper into complexity while at the same time looking to see if there's just some basic easy measures that, although the model might not be perfect, functions well enough to give us some useful clinical informa information. So what we're doing is when we divide our into our sections, what we might do is we focus on the sections that we have. So what we'll learn over time is perhaps if you have that anterior section of an aneurysm, that might provide enough information on the abnormality of it that even if you have some dropout in other sections, you're still getting a, an assessment. But I do think this is to the point, like I think ultrasound inherently is going to have some limitations because of image quality. I think that's always going to be a problem that we have to figure out. Is it something that can be worked around or is this, you know, is this a real serious limitation that makes us have to focus more on MRI and CT scans?